Greetings, AP Chem students. Um, hopefully you noticed, but there is a PDF of the notes that I will cover here. I'm, I'm using Smart Notebook, but if you click on that, um, a little PDF of, of the slides I'll cover shows up. So if you want to use that to follow along, that could be potentially helpful. But what we're looking at here for this little video, because you've got a quick check coming up on the second day of school, is some refreshers about sig figs, dimensional analysis, and density, I believe, are the topics we'll cover here. First of all, sig figs, remember when we do math in science, especially chemistry, a lot of the numbers that we use come from measurements. Measurements have error, so therefore our math has to be done a little differently. We have to make sure we don't report an answer to a problem, especially in the laboratory, with more sig or more fit digits than we should based on the errors in the measurements. So first off, if you got to remember when looking at a number, when looking at a measurement in chemistry class, how many sig figs does that number have? And if you kind of remember the rules, it's really just looking at whether or not the zero counts. Okay, we have all these rules on sig figs. The first rule is if it's a non-zero digit, it's definitely significant. So all the other rules are based on whether or not we count the zero as significant, or if it's just being used as a placeholder. So a simple way to try and remember that, remember all the rules, yes, you can memorize the rules, or we can kind of do this little activity. So sketch a map of the United States and label the Pacific Ocean P and the Atlantic Ocean A. So here we have a lovely, this is my hand-drawn sketch uh -huh, of the United States. Little red dot for Menor. So hopefully you remember that the Pacific Ocean is over here, the Atlantic Ocean is over there. And what we're going to turn Pacific and Atlantic into is present or absent. Present or absent. So when we look at a number, a measurement, we look to see whether or not a decimal point is present or absent. If a decimal point is present, then we start on the left of the number and cross out zeros until you get to the first non-zero. And that will tell you how many sig figs there are. If the decimal point is absent, you start on the right side of the measurement, the numbers, cross out zeros until you get to a non-zero, and that tells you how many sig figs. So here's a couple different examples. 5,850. There is no decimal point present, so it is absent. So I start on the right, I cross off that zero, and then that means I have three sig figs in this measurement. 0 0.0245 decimal point is present, cross off zeros until I get to a non-zero, three sig figs. 4,031.90, decimal point is present, start at the Pacific, I don't have any zeros to cross off, so all six of those are sig figs. 0 0.0070610, zeros all over the place, but there is a decimal point present. Cross off the zeros till I get to a non-zero. That means these five digits are significant. So again, that helps you remember how many sig figs. And we use that when we multiply and divide. Because when we multiply and divide in chemistry class, you have to look at the numbers that you're multiplying and dividing to determine how many numbers are in your answer. Okay. When we add and subtract, it's a little different. You're looking at the decimal point. But here we see some lovely calculations. All right. And when I plug these calculations into the calculator, into the, your stupid machine, it just bleh, spits out an answer. So this is what your calculator tends to spit out when we're doing these um, problems. So for number one, you're multiplying 27.533 times 1.921. So I check and I see that I have five sig figs in this measurement. I have four sig figs in this measurement. Didn't have to use any of the zero rules. 
but ultimately we see that your answer is going to have four sig figs in it because it wants to match the least number. All right. So give yourself a second. See if you can figure out what you think these answers should be based on sig figs. And then come back to the video and check it out. So now you should be checking your answers. This is what I got based on sig figs. So there's only four sig figs in this answer. This measurement only has two sig figs, so my answer can only have two. Here I have three sig figs, so my answer can only have three. Here I only have two sig figs, so I have to round to 340, or you can use scientific notation to make that answer look a little prettier if you want. All right. Now when adding and subtracting, you have to watch the numbers after the decimal. Your answer matches the measurement with the least amount of numbers after the decimal. And I tried to put a little squiggly line to indicate that number. So here we have 212.8526 tenths, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths, plus 49.34 tenths, hundredths. So my answer can only go to the hundredths because that is my least um, accurate measurement. So I can't add those numbers together and report an answer all the way to the ten thousandths because that's just not right based on the measurements that I'm adding together. So again, see if you can round those answers off appropriately based on sig figs, pause the video, and then check your work. All right, so now you should be checking your answers. So again, number one, I can only go to the hundredth. Number two, thousandths versus way over here, so I can only go to the thousandths. Number two, I'm sorry, that was number three. This is number two. I've got hundredths, hundredths, thousandths, tenths. So that's why I can only go to the tenths. And then number four, I've got a whole number minus something to the hundredths, so I can only report my answer as a whole number. So hopefully all those lovely rules and everything with sig figs is flooding back into you, and we can use that all year long. It is a point of contention on the AP exam. You do have to report answers to sig figs. We'll worry about that later, but always doing them all year long can only help. Now your good friend dimensional analysis, remember this is a problem solving tool and this is very popular in chemistry because so many of our problems are analyzing units, switching from one form of a measurement to another. And so using dimensional analysis can be very helpful. So just as a little refresher, okay, how many cups are in 15.95 liters? So I have a given piece of information, 15.95 liters, I place that over one and I'm going to use conversion factors along the way in an effort to convert this measurement to a different one, liters to cups. And you can see I have some useful information here. We're not expected to have all these metric to English conversions memorized. But you want to use those facts in an effort to get to your final answer. The power of dimensional analysis is by converting, changing units from one form to another. And in order to do that, I must make sure my units are diagonal from each other, that they're canceling each other out in this process. So I need to change liters. What can I change liters to? Lots of options, but I'm going to use this one because it's sitting right here for me to use. There are 3.785 liters in one gallon. I want cups, so I'm not done here. I need to continue on. Now I want to change gallon. And so what should I change it to? That looks good. One gallon has four quarts. Now I know we're all smart here, and maybe you want to say, okay, well I can change gallon into cups because I can do this in my head and I can figure out there's 16, blah, blah, blah. I advise against that. When you're given facts, just kind of plug them in as they're given to you. It just eliminates more chances for error. So now I can change my quartz to cups 
because I see that there are four cups in every quart. And now when I do the math, you multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom, and then divide. So 15.95 times 1 times 4 times 4 will give me 255.2. On the bottom, I just have the 3.785. And now when I do the division, I'll get an answer from my calculator, but again, another awesome part of dimensional analysis. However many numbers you're given to start, that's how many sig figs are in your answer. Everything in a conversion factor is a fact, so it doesn't factor in to our final answer. So my final answer here should be 67.42 cups. Off times more so in physics, but every once in a while in chemistry, we might need to change both units if we've got units in the numerator and denominator. So here we have 8.5 milliliters per second, and I need to change that to teaspoons per hour. So time is pretty familiar to us. I can immediately change my seconds into something. A lot of people know there's 3,600 seconds in an hour, so you're free to do that. Or you can baby step. 60 seconds is one minute. 60 minutes is one hour. Notice the units are still diagonal from each other, but we started in the denominator, so it just looks a little different. Hour is what I want in my denominator, so that's good. So now I need to change milliliters to teaspoons. Yay, useful information. So I just come all the way over here. Milliliters goes in the denominator. And there are 4.93 milliliters per teaspoon. Again, multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom. So 8.5 times 60 times 60, 30,600. On the bottom is just the 4.93. Again, since there's only two sig figs to start, I can only have two in my answer. So this comes out to be 6,200 teaspoons per hour. Not a requirement that you use dimensional analysis, but most people say that's the way to go for many a chemistry problem. On a final note here, density. Remember that density density is a derived unit, a derived measurement where you have the mass of something and the volume of something. You compare that and you get its density. If we're talking about um, water has a density of one gram per milliliter and that's typically at 25 degrees Celsius. So if something has a density greater than that, it would sink in water. If something has a density less than one, it would float in water. Um, but you can always manipulate this equation to solve for what you might need. So yes, density is mass over volume. Grams per milliliter, grams per centimeter cubed, the most common way. We could have kilograms, we could have liters and stuff like that, but typically we stick to the grams per level. But if I need to know volume, okay, just through a manipulation of the variables, volume ends up being mass divided by density. Okay, and perhaps someone taught you the little circle technique, all right, where you have density, mass, volume. So if you want to solve density, you cover up the D, and it says it's M over V. If you want to solve volume, you cover up the V, and it says it's M over D. And if you want to know the mass, it would be density times volume. All right, so there'll be some questions using density. I hope this helped, and I really hope that you do fantastic on your first quick check. See you soon.